So whenever there's one or two or more aircraft uh, getting their sensors on one of these objects, it increases our fidelity, increases our you know, confidence level in those tracks. To get started, I did have a question for you. So do do we use the term UAP or UFO? Well, UAP is the, the proper nomenclature uh, as been communicated in, in various legal documents in the in the US government now. And UAP is defined uh, as unidentified anomalous phenomena. Now, uh, not aerial or aerospace, it's meant to be domain agnostic. Oh, really? See, everyone I've heard says aerial, so it's anomalous? Yes, there was a time, there was a point where the consideration would be aerospace, but um, yeah, anomalous uh, better, better fully encapsulates um, the breadth of where these objects could be located. That's right, because didn't in one of the interviews, I, I, I watched all your interviews, I think one of them, somebody was talking about them going under the water or into the water, is that correct? It is, and you know, there's been some conversation about um, whether there's been uh, difficulty in getting certain players within the government or Department of Defense to play ball due to some of the semantics around the domain terminology. Everything in the U.S. government is kind of domain-specific, for better or worse, um, to a large degree anyways. And so with the Space Force and the Air Force and the Navy. Um, and so when you are assigning your name to a specific domain, um, it gives uh, it gives ability for people to say that either is or isn't my problem in a way that anomalous doesn't. And then, how did you become a part of the UAP conversation? Well, I became <laughs> accidentally, essentially. So um, this isn't an area that I have any or had any real expertise in. I'll say um, when I was younger, it was you know I think like anyone else that grows up in the United States, they learn about UFOs and aliens and have that, you know, cultural baggage as they grow up. But um, it wasn't something that preoccupied my thought, you know, in college or professionally in any sense. Um, and I ended up joining the Navy to fly F-18 Super Hornets. And I did that for about 11 years total. Uh, I did a couple of combat deployments. Uh, but when I came back from the first one, we upgraded our, our, equipment on our jets. We upgraded from the APG-73 radar to the APG-79, um, which is, um, it's a it's a magnitude better, you know, radar, and it's kind of a, a digital radar compared to a mechanically scanned array radar. Uh, and so just, you know, everything's better on it, just as a general statement. Uh, and we did that, we were noticing objects that we hadn't seen before. Um, we first thought they were just some type of radar blip or something or, you know, some kind of error in the radar. And there are there are physical errors that can occur, such as, you know, weather inversions or weird things that cause um, uh, radar returns to not actually represent something physical uh, or where they say it is. And that was mostly a problem on the older radars. The new ones, um, they weren't supposed to have that problem, however, but that was our first inclination. Eventually, we got close enough to see them on our optical sensors. And then we eventually saw them with our eyeballs. Um, I think it's important to denote here because people don't quite understand how complicated these systems are, uh, but the jets are really like nodes in a network in a sense. Um, and our sensors and our data gets communicated across. So whenever there's one or two or more aircraft uh, getting their sensors on one of these objects, it increases our fidelity, increases our you know confidence level in those tracks. And on any daily basis, there's multiple aircraft, multiple jets out in the areas and these objects are being correlated across this whole sensor network, essentially. Um, and so that's the kind of information we're talking about when we talk about multiple censored uh, radar contacts that are unexplainable, which I think in the last report, there was about 80 of them. And so these were the objects we were running into to answer your question in the longest possible way. I apologize. Um, it's but, a talk show. You're good. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we were, we, were, um, we were seeing things we couldn't explain, and they continue to not be explained even as we gathered more data about them. And that's where we are today. And we didn't consider them UFOs or UAP at the time, but that's where the conversation has developed to because they are still unidentified. And we've had to change the terminology a little bit um, to get our, get our minds better around it. That is pretty cool. I did not know about the, the connection of them like nodes. Is that happening basically in real time? Um, as close to as you can expect. I mean, with latency and everything else, but um, that's so cool. My dad, I, I'm slightly close to it. So my dad was in the Air Force and in the you know late 
80s, early 90s, they put the GPS system into the B-32 stealth bomber. That was his big project, and it didn't become declassified for like 15 years after. So he didn't tell us until it became declassified. And um, it's so cool to see how quickly, because, you know, that was the most advanced thing ever, right? Putting it into the in the bomber. And to see how quickly it's advanced is kind of awesome, given that we consider government typically pretty slow. We do consider them pretty slow. And I, I wonder... I would consider them increasingly slow compared to the free market, at least in the United States. Um, so although historically that has been the case, I think more and more the only way the government, U.S. government can keep pace technologically with our adversaries is through greater access through the innovation ecosystems, startups, smaller businesses, such as we see with the Defense Innovation Unit and those other other uh, entities within the government trying to harness that that innovation that we're so special in. but. It's you know, a little bit wilder and harder to manage. <laughs>